In this video, I want to explain undermethylation, its symptoms, how to diagnose it correctly, which as you will see is not done through an MTHFR gene test, and also the right nutrients and supplements that benefit undermethylators. As you will see, there's a lot of bad info about undermethylation online, so we will also debunk a few myths along the way. First things first, what even is undermethylation? To understand undermethylation, you need to understand methylation, which is kind of a buzzword in nutrition and biohacking communities. Methylation is the addition of a methyl group to another molecule, and a methyl group is made up of one carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms. So it's a biochemical process, and see it like an on-off switch that helps regulate important processes in the body. For example, methyl groups can be added to enzymes, hormones, or neurotransmitters to regulate their levels. And this is important for energy production, mental health, or even the copying of your DNA. For instance, methylation is required for the conversion of serotonin to melatonin, for the synthesis of creatine, and also for the activation of certain vitamins, like folate or vitamin B12. What that means is that methylation and also demethylation, so taking away a methyl group, happens very quickly and millions of times in every single cell of your body. But there can be issues, and this brings me to undermethylation and undermethylators. These terms refer to people with lower than optimal methylation happening in their body, and it's usually due to a low availability of methyl groups or a potential deficiency in a cofactor nutrient. The result is not enough methylation, which leads to all kinds of symptoms, as well as a tendency for certain diseases. Of course, the opposite is also possible, which would be overmethylation, so too much methylation taking place. But in this video, let's stick to undermethylation and first discuss possible symptoms. Best studied is the relationship between undermethylation and mental illness. That's because undermethylators are the classic depression patient. They tend to have low neurotransmitter levels, so low serotonin, low dopamine, and low adrenaline. Things can get more complicated when they also have other issues, like copper overload, which would keep their serotonin and dopamine low, but spike adrenaline. But that's a topic for a different video. Generally, if you think of undermethylators, you want to think of low neurotransmitters. Other symptoms and health issues undermethylators tend to have include a lot of allergies due to their high histamine, impaired detoxification because methylation is an important liver detoxification pathway. This is explained in more detail in a different video. Low energy output and fatigue because of their problems with creatine synthesis and also possibly high estrogen because the methylation dependent enzyme COMT is responsible for the elimination of excess estrogen. Interestingly, undermethylators also have certain character traits in common. For example, they tend to be perfectionists and high achievers. They're also often very competitive, have a high libido, and tend to be calm on the outside but tense within. Of course, never use these symptoms as the basis for diagnosing yourself with undermethylation. It's a little more complicated than that, and some people have a lot of these traits and illnesses, and some only have a few. This brings me to the next part of the video, which is how to diagnose undermethylation correctly. And to be honest, this is where the confusion really starts. Most practitioners will try to determine your methylation status based on genetic testing. They will look at certain genes that are related to methylation and see if there's a gene variation. These genes can be MTHFR, COMT, MTR, MTRR, or others. If they find a variation, for example, in the MTHFR gene, which is the one that is most commonly used, they will assume you are an undermethylator. The problem with this approach is that there are countless genes that affect methylation, and some variations might lower your ability to methylate, while others can even enhance it. For example, I don't have an MTHFR gene variation, but I'm still an undermethylator. And on the other hand, you also have people with the gene variation that don't tolerate methylfolate, which is supposedly the most potent methyl donor out there. More on this later in the video. What you have to understand for correct testing is that we are less interested in individual genes 
and more in their net effect, so the end result when all genes work together. And for that, a good proxy is whole blood histamine, because histamine is broken down through methylation. So the higher your histamine, the lower your methylation status, and the lower your histamine, the higher your methylation status. The following ideal range is based on the Walsh protocol, which in my opinion is the best methylation protocol out there, and I also explain it in a different video in more detail. So normal methylators will have a histamine range between 40 and 70, which means that if you're over 70, you will be classified as an undermethylator, and if you're under 40, you will be classified as an overmethylator. An alternative to whole blood histamine would be testing the SAMe SAH ratio, but this test is even more difficult to get than the whole blood histamine test, especially if you live outside the US. Here, undermethylators would have a low ratio, typically below 6. Now, both of these tests need to be done and interpreted by an experienced practitioner. You will not understand them as a beginner. If you're interested in a practitioner, I have a list of the world's best, at least in my opinion, that is part of my paid course. Great, now that we talked about symptoms and diagnosis, let's go on to nutrition and supplements. So once you know you're an undermethylator, what can you do to improve your methylation status? In simple terms, we want to increase your methylation, which usually means increasing the availability of methyl groups in your body. In terms of diet, most undermethylators do best on a high protein diet, especially animal proteins, because they are rich in methionine, which is the primary methyl donor in our diet. Now, of course, methyl donors can also be supplemented directly. So you could take methionine, you could take SAMe, which is basically activated and more potent methionine, and you could also take TMG, so trimethylglycine. All of these fall under the category of direct methyl donors. You can also support methylation indirectly through supplements that spare methyl groups like creatine, phosphatidylcholine, and carnitine. And other methylators usually also benefit from certain cofactor nutrients like zinc, inositol, vitamin B6, magnesium, calcium, and antioxidants. Of course, if you are a beginner, please set up your supplement program together with your practitioner because unfortunately there's a lot you can do wrong here. Which takes me to methylfolate. Online you see a lot of guides saying that all undermethylators need methylfolate as a supplement. But that's not entirely true. You see, methylfolate is both a potent methyl donor as well as a methyl reducer at the same time. I explain the process in more detail in a different video, but basically methylfolate donates its methyl group outside the cell, but inside the cell at the level of the DNA, it takes away methyl groups. That's because all folates, including methylfolates, increase neurotransmitter reuptake. This helps if you have excessive neurotransmitter levels, for example, if you're adrenaline dominant. But if you already have low neurotransmitters, for example, low serotonin, which we often see in undermethylators, it can make things worse. The problem is that this effect only takes place with a delay, usually of two to three months. So in the beginning, undermethylators that take methylfolate usually feel great because of the additional methyl groups that they now have available. But then after two to three months, the neurotransmitter reuptake effect takes effect and they sometimes crash. Now, of course, I'm generalizing here, and this doesn't happen to everyone. Some undermethylators definitely benefit from taking methylfolate, but others crash on it. And like I said before, the risk is highest in those that already have low serotonin levels to begin with. So if you're having side effects with it, then that's usually what's going on. Great. To wrap up this video, all of this was probably a lot of new information, and you might even be overwhelmed by the complexity of methylation. The key takeaway is really that undermethylators suffer from a poor availability of methyl groups. And the diagnosis should not only be done through genetic testing, but also through tests that measure the net effect of all genes together, like whole blood histamine. The condition can be improved a lot by certain nutrients that either deliver methyl groups directly or by nutrients that help your body conserve them. And the biggest mistake many people make is thinking all undermethylators need methylfolate 
when in fact some do worse usually after two to three months. I hope you liked this video and I see you in the next one.